All right, we're talking about solving radical equations, and we're going to work through some examples here. And the first ones will be pretty easy. The first one is the square root of x minus 4 equals 3, and we want to solve for x. Well, in general, when we're solving an equation for the variable, we need to isolate the variable. So a pretty obvious first step here is to add 4 to each side and the negative 4 and the positive 4 cancel out. And that leaves us with the square root of x on the left and that equals 7 on the right. Now we need to find x. Right now we have the square root of x so to get the x out from under the radical we simply square it. And so we have just squared the left side of the equation so we also have to square the right side. Whatever you do to one side of an equation you need to do exactly the same thing to the other side. So on the left, the square root of x squared is just x, and on the right, 7 squared is 49. And that's our answer. Not too bad. The next example is the square root of 2x plus 20 equals 8. Well, in this case, we have all of this stuff under the radical. And so the x is trapped there under the radical. I can get rid of the radical by squaring both sides of the equation. So I'll go ahead and do that first in this case. And when I square both sides on the left side, the square root and the square undo each other. So I end up with 2x plus 20 on the left equals 64. And now we're down to a basic, uh, basic algebra problem where we just solve for the variable. So the rest here is pretty routine. Subtract 20 from each side and those cancel and we're left with 2x equals 44 and then divide both sides by 2 and you can see pretty quickly that x will be 22. Alright, another example. The square root of 2x minus 5 over 7 equals 3. Now we have a fraction in here, but that's not a problem. That fraction is under the radical, but that's not a problem either. That's going to completely go away if I square both sides. The square root and the square undo each other, and it leaves me with 2x minus 5 over 7 on the left. And on the right I have 3 squared, which is 9. And from here it's pretty routine. Just multiply both sides by 7, and these 7's cancel, and that leaves us with 2x minus 5 equals 63, and then add 5 to each side, and I get 2x equals 68, and then divide both sides by 2, and I get x is 34, and that's the answer. All right, in the next one, I have 4 times the square root of a equals 3 times the square root of 2 we're told to solve for a. Well, I could divide by 4 on each side, or I could square both sides. Either, either approach will work in this case. Sometimes there's more than one path to the correct answer. I'm going to start by dividing both sides by 4. And the 4's cancel out on the left, and I just have the square root of a equals 3 root 2 over 4. And now I'll square both sides. And on the left, the square root of a squared is just a. And on the right, take note that the 3 will get squared, the square root of 2 will get squared, and the 4 will get squared. So the 3 squared is 9, the square root of 2 squared is 2, and the 4 squared is 16. So I have 9 times 2 over 16, that's 18 over 16 and that simplifies to 9 over 8. So a is 9 eighths. Alright, this next example uses one of our equations from physics. t is equal to the square root of 2h over g. This equation tells us that if an object falls a height h, it will take this much time to fall. In other words, things take longer to fall farther, and this relates the time and the distance or the height that it falls. So this could this could refer to any object as long as we're on Earth and we know this value for g. So for example, maybe uh, here's this this building here, and someone has climbed up to the top of the building, 
say this little girl is up here and she's dropped another piano off the building okay and so there it goes it's falling down and the question is how far will it fall in six seconds well we can find out by using this equation we need to find h the height how far it falls in six seconds so to find h I need to get h out from under the radical and to do that I can square both sides so I'm going to take this equation and square both sides and that will give me t squared equals 2h over g and now it's pretty easy to solve for for h I'm going to multiply both sides by g and over on the right the g's will cancel out and I'm going to divide both sides by 2 so I'll put it divided by 2 and if I put a di divided by 2 over here this 2 up here will cancel out and notice that that leaves me with h all by itself equal to this so the the algebra is done now h is gt squared over 2 I just need to put in the numbers and calculate an answer and g is a known number on earth the acceleration due to gravity that's what we call little g is 9.8 meters per second squared and the time here is given in the problem is six seconds and this is t squared so I need to square that six seconds and then that's divided by two and then once again note the units here I have this seconds squared in the denominator and that, that that's a seems to be a strange unit but this is something we know from physics the acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared and just note that that second squared there is going to cancel out because this seconds right here is also squared so it's going to cancel out and it leaves us with meters which is a, a unit for length which is what we would expect for height and so now we just multiply 9.8 times 36 divided by 2 and it comes out to 176.4 meters so this uh, picture here is not really to scale this would be a long drop 176.4 meters and let's also solve a problem dealing with a roller coaster loop a roller coaster moves around in this loop and it's moving at some velocity v that's the speed and the question is how fast does it need to go to stay on the track if it goes too slow the either the the cars will fall off the track or the people up here would fall out of the cars it needs to be going fast enough for them to stay on and we know from physics that v is equal to the square root of rg this is the minimum speed for it to stay on the track if the loop is radius r and g is what we know from physics is 9.8 meters per second squared so let's say that the, um, it's going at 8 meters per second at the top of the loop this is given v is 8 meters per second that's some given information for the problem what should the radius of the loop be that's what we don't know well to solve this we can take this equation and square both sides and when I do that I get v squared on the left and rg on the right and so if I need to find r I can just take this and divide both sides by g and the g's will cancel I have r all by itself equal to this v squared over g so let's write it that way r is equal to v squared over g and if we want to know the radius of the loop we just put in the numbers v is 8 meters per second that's squared and g we know from physics is 9.8 meters per second squared now this second squared down on the bottom cancels with this second here because it is actually squared so and then notice we have this meters here which is also squared oh, I shouldn't have crossed out the two the, the meters right there is squared so one of those meters will cancel out with this one and I'll, I'll be left with a single meter so this comes out to 64 meters 
over 9.8 and then we can actually just do the division either by hand or on the calculator and we get 6.53 meters. If it's going to be moving at 8 meters per second the radius of the loop should be 6.53 meters. Or you can make the loop a little bit tighter. This would be the maximum. If the loop were bigger than that, then you would need a faster speed for the cars to stay on the track.